Good. Right, so I think that's very significant, right? So the, the, so, you know, for the Bible, it, it's clearly an authority that he wants to, to, to draw on, uh, and he certainly doesn't want to contradict the Bible, um, but uh, he doesn't want to be limited, I guess, by the text of the Bible. Um, uh, actually, there was an important controversy during his lifetime. Uh, he was actually accused of being an atheist, um, and, uh, and you know, part of it was that you know, he had really these sort of mechanical, rational explanations for all sorts of things and didn't sort of um, just stick to the, the strict text of the Bible in making his explanations, right? So, so even though, you know, you can say that he's, he's basing his arguments on the Bible, it's not as simple as that, right? That um, even though he's using the Bible as an authority, um, in some sense he's really using other forms of evidence as well, um, a kind of, um, I guess you could say, logic, um, where he, he, he uses certain pieces from the Bible and then kind of extrapolates from them. And, he, and, and that's his, his method more than kind of depending upon the, on the Bible in order to give him um, the conclusions that he wants. Okay? So, um, we're going to take a look now at the, at the uses of speech um, that he talks about. Um, so you remember we, we had this, these, these functions of speech that we talked about, right? So, so he, 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 he laid out in the beginning, I mean, he, the, the section is very well organized. You know, he, he has, has the, the overview in the beginning and he goes back and um, lays out some of the detail, right? So we had uh, uh, register our thoughts, recall them to memory, and then, uh, and then communicate with others, right? And so this is the passage um, where he talks about this. Let's just kind of break this down a little bit, right? The first point that he makes, um, is that the general use of speech is to transfer our mental discourse into verbal uh, or the train of our thoughts into a train of words. And he's using this metaphor of the train, and I'm, I've just kind of like made a picture of this train for you, right? Um, which is to say there's a thought, and then a thought, and a thought, and you transfer it into these words, um, apple, orange, banana. Those are my, those are my examples, right? Um, and um, what's going on here is that he's saying that um, these thoughts, when they're on their own, they just kind of, you know, you've got a thought and then there's another thought and there's another thought and they just kind of disappear once they're thought. Um, it's only when um, you have the words um, that um, you're able to, what he says, um, to do two things. He's got two commodities, two uses, where one is the registering of the consequences of our thoughts, uh, which being apt to slip out of our memory and put us to a new labor may again be recalled by such words as they were marked by. Right? So that the first use of names is to serve for marks or notes of remembrance. And that's very, very important. So, so uh, just, uh, I guess, try and recall uh, or remember this, this term marks or, or marks of remembrance or distinguishing marks because it's going to recur uh, for us in this course. Um, and he's saying that we're, we're marking the thought. We're sort of, um, we're, we're kind of, you know, yeah, I guess you're, you're, you're putting a tag on it. You're putting a little... Um, you know, an X, or well, you're putting the word, you're attaching the word to the thought, right? And he says that that's really key um, for us to be able to register consequences of our thoughts and to be able to recall them, right? We need these, these tags on our thoughts um, in order to be able to work with our thoughts, okay? So that's the first um, point that he's, that he's, he's saying that, that thoughts have this um, connection, these ha thoughts have these connections to each other, but these connections are lost to us if we're not able to, to, to add these tags to our thoughts, right? And then all of a sudden, um, we're able then to, to kind of recall those thoughts um, with using the tags, right? Okay, so the next use of speech, he says, um, is that um, we're able to signify, and he talks about signs, right? Um, and here, he's got this other idea about communication, right? And so he's saying, um, when many use the same words to signify by their connection or one to another what they conceive or think of each man and also what they desire, fear, or have any other passion for, and also what they desire, fear, or have any other passion for. And for this use, they are called signs. And so what, what he's talking about is that you've got these signs so that um, different people can use the same words to signify one to another what they're thinking. Right? And so basically, you know, you've got the thought, you've got the thought, but you want to make sure you're, you're both on the same thought, right? Um, and so that's why you, we use these marks um, that designate those thoughts and then they become sort of the, the common point for d d two different people or three, whatever, many people to come together to be 
um, you know, thinking the same thought at the same time, or, or, or at a different time, but in any case, um, being able to refer to that mark as the, as, as the reference to that thought, right? So that, that's what he's saying enables communication, okay? Uh, so that's then the, the, the other use of speech, right, that he's giving to us, right? Um, and then he actually extends this by saying um, we, we actually have uh, an intuition or a knowledge of cause and effect only uh, through the use of language. And special uses of language are these first to register what by cogitation we find to be the cause of anything present or past, and what we find um, things present or past may produce or affect. Right? So this, this relationship of cause and effect is also something um, that is, um, can be grasped then through language. Right? And that's a very important thing for him because um, that's then uh, what he says, it's, it's, it's in some is acquiring of arts. It's so, so any type of, of craft, anything, any type of skill that you acquire can only be acquired through this linking of cause and effect. Right? And so that's really then uh, the prerequisite, this, this, this linking of cause and effect, that's a prerequisite for, uh, for human skills, uh, for us to be developing different skills to do different things. Right? Uh, and that's then for him also <coughs> then this consequence of language. So next, um, he's also saying um, that, you know, he's emphasizing again the ways in which the communication function of language um, uh, is, is a social phenomenon and helps in enabling all sorts of social processes. You know, and so he names these, these three different um, ways in which language um, enables social processes. So it allows us to counsel and teach, he says. It allows for mutual help, right, cooperation. Um, and then finally, he says it allows for pleasure and ornament, right? And so, you know, we, we can, he says we play with our words, uh, we please and delight ourselves and others, we use it for ornament. Um, there's, there's some sense in which um, language is linked to a kind of both an artistic function and ornamental function um, uh, that he doesn't emphasize very much, but um, it, it's, it's important that he notes it um, because this will become more important for us for, for other thinkers later on. Okay, so, so uh, language then has both a kind of technical function for us on our own in linking cause and effect, but then also this social function in allowing us um, to be able to interact uh, more uh, in, in more complex ways uh, with other humans. Okay? Um, so those were the uses of speech. He also then indicates right after these the abuses of speech. So, so even though speech gives us a, um, certain advantages, um, with these advantages come some, uh, I guess, some disadvantages, right? Um, so um, he first talks about three different ways in which um, speech can lead to error and deception. And that's really what kind of that's the, that's the big thing that he really sees as the main abuse of language. So we might, you know, we might be wrong in registering our thoughts, right? Um, we might use words metaphorically, and he doesn't like that because we're deceiving others by using our words metaphorically. Um, and then finally, you know, words allow us to, to lie about our words, to, to, to lie. So without words, it's you can't lie, right? You can't, yeah, so if it, it's, it, it's, that, it's that disconnect between the word and the thought that creates the lie. If you don't have a word connecting to a thought, you can't have a disconnect, obviously, and so there's no possibility of lying, right? So it's, yeah, I don't know, if you, you'd have to, I guess we could think about, about the dog and whether the dog can lie. Uh, probably not, and then we can think about Kanzi and whether Kanzi can lie. That when, that's another, I think that's a bigger question that we'll have to com come back to, right? Um, so, um, but here for Hobbes, I think we're seeing um, a very particular view of the way language works and, um, and what he sees as sort of the, um, the ideal kind of language, which is really a, a straightforward correspondence between thoughts and words, right? So he's, he's giving us this relationship between thoughts and words as the, uh, the hallmark of language, but then he's also saying that that, um, that correspondence, um, that I guess true correspondence, is really um, the primary way in which language works, right? And that all these different possibilities for error uh, are then um, sort of, I guess, uh, yeah, abuses of language, okay? Um, again, uh, we want to kind of, we like his ideas, but we want to sort of set that in, um, 
uh, in contrast to other ideas we'll see later on. But so we'll just, just hold on to this and we'll, <coughs> we'll see some, some other interpretations later. Finally, he also talks about how um, speech, even though it can help people, it can be used to counsel other people, um, it can be used to delight and give pleasure, it can also be used to abuse, to, to, to hurt other people. Right? And so he indicates that, that, that we can use speech to grieve or hurt others. Um, and, and though he does, does give this example, uh, or this exception, where he says, un unless one as a governor is correcting those others. So he's, he's, uh, this is, this is uh, sort of uh, <coughs> foreshadowing of his theory of the state, uh, in which it's OK if you're the, if you're the state to, to, uh, to, 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 I guess, to grieve or hurt others if the state is somehow um, helping to, to somehow um, correct those for the uses of the state, right? Um, so, so that's, you know, so those are, those are the possible abuses you can have of language um, that, that he indicates, and they're also then connected with the uses, right? So again, he's, like I said before, he's focused on the correspondence between thoughts and words, and he sees that as, as the main use, and then he sees that the breaking of that correspondence as abuse, um, and he sees both the socially productive and the socially destructive uh, possibilities of language. Okay.